The first question is, what are the research frontiers and advances in technology that enhance our ability to understand groundwater recharge and flow, especially when in situ data are sparse or inaccessible? So let's try to keep our uh, uh, comments to the technology and to very specific, you know, one word or so that it's easy for us to capture and, you know, to say. that Burke talked about was just amazing. So I'm just, yeah. It's doable if the political will is there, you know, to allow the campaigns that would be needed to be carried out. Also, um, along the lines of airborne, I think as not thinking about small drones, but like larger drone-based measurements for all sorts of, um, I mean, temperature actually can be helpful mm -hmm. for groundwater surface water interactions and then also for getting better measurements of ET that we can use to help close the water balance. more than French bra. So I do think that having, you know, if we would have, despite the fact that we have the DLIAs in Prague, having two pairs of satellite and, you know, knocking down the scale of the total water surge, because closing the border balance is, is really powerful in terms of, you know, evaluate the different component and look at the driver and then being able to reduce uncertainty on. Yeah, I mean, I suspect that Airborne EM can bring the footprint down by an order of magnitude compared to Gray's. But depend what you want to do. So then again, so I, I would agree, but what is the scale at which you want to, you know, so for something, if you are able to validate the region on a big scale, so maybe in some places, I mean, if you want all the detail, but what do we want to, then you're right, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like a, it's maybe not an either or thing. I think. Yeah. A higher resolution grace is amazing, but that still doesn't give you all the component. Like, if we really want to understand systems, we need you can close the water balance, but like, I think there's still uncertainty in a lot of those other terms. And, and having things like the structure to actually get at the properties and the structure no, in the I system is still really valuable. So, I would say yes to what you're saying, but just as an and, not as a like instead of. Yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't mean. I'm just like, yeah. if you want to ever. Like what are the steps? So when I was looking at the glacier, I'm like, yeah, you want to model or you want to know the source of that, but you also want to, you know, but if we can, you know, define what is the, you know, how much is the contribution, that's already, so I agree with you. Eventually, you want to have the full picture and the detail. As um, managed aquifer recharge expands, uh, I, I think that this would, uh, especially if they can refine their the, the scale which uh, uh, they can do this I, th I think that uh, this would help manage those those systems much better can I can I follow up on the closing the water balance comments uh, forgive me if you said this already but you know we do a pretty good job monitoring precipitation from space but if we were better at um, getting the uh, evapotranspiration and, uh, and we'll get, you know, runoff from SWAT. And we, can, and we can do okay ET with certain methods, but there's no dedicated mission for that. But uh, when you have all those, then you can better sort of close the water budget and, and estimate how much water is, is, uh, is recharging. So, I mean, the question is asking, what is the advances in technology? So I would just say one word, increased resolution. Is that correct to say technology, or is it too, too darn broad? No, that's, that's not in technology. I see our one thing, I guess, thinking would be like, what is going to allow us you know, to do different, different technologies? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Because I think the technology was presented by many people in this table, uh, Insar, uh, Grace, SWAT, um, um, Aero, Airborne, uh, Airborne EM, uh, and then in the morning you <clears throat> presented the Magneto Tellurics. So we have a lot of technology words already. I mean, so we don't have to go to a new uh, thing to do that. But obviously that would be very easy to answer this question. But the, I think it's what is standing in the way of using all of these. Esther. So there's one thing we haven't covered at all is um, GPS. And GPS is tricky because it's, it's remote sensing but required a ground-based receiver. So it's not an in-situ data, it's a remote sensing data. And GPS has been shown in the past um, couple of uh, years to be able to measure surface water changes, um, the amount of snow cover and the amount of water, uh, surface water that is uh, removed, for example, during the drought. So I think one of the technology advances that we have is that we now have this cap capability with ground deformation to track surface water with GPS and track how the surface water interact at the border of the um, aquifer to recharge aquifer system and then we can use INSAR to track ground deformation within aquifer system. So we kind of have this dual ground deformation monitoring that don't look at the same part of the water system. So if you have a lot of vegetation, the inside, because you have to have, you know, a correlated image. So if you have a lot of vegetation, then... So vegetation is only a problem if you're looking at places like um, the Amazonian forest at this point, because we have the repeat satellite that I show with Cosmos Climate, you have up to one day repeat. So it's one, four, and eight days. So you don't have a lot of decorrelation with high repeat. Um, if you look at the old satellite, like ERS and MVSA that had 35 days repeat, it's a lot more difficult. But the high repeat really helps. With the cost of the year, the cost yeah. Of the yeah, and even since, you know, like 12 days, we get, we get, yeah, and NISAR is Alba, and NISAR is a longer wavelength, so there's going to be vegetation penetration. I'm not expecting that even in, in Indonesia we will have decorrelation with Alba. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I would say, and this is kind of along the lines of what Harry was saying with the airborne. Is you know I think one of the exciting things about the airborne is it it gets at three D essentially. So it really gets at the the subsurface uh, property distributions, which may not be important for certain parts of the water budget, but but are for for a lot of questions about groundwater, and so. Um, you know, on my wish list would be being able to do more with remote sensing. So, you know, the airborne EM, it, it can, like, like Burke was saying, it can't really see the water. You know, it can see salt water, it can see lithologic changes, but thinking about more things that can be measured in 3D. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, maybe this is outside the scope of this question because it just says um, for getting at recharge and flow, but. Um, water quality has come up several times, um, and isotopes also for characterizing systems, which, I mean, I think that's like a far front. Like all of this remote sensing, you say, okay, but we can't say anything about quality really. And so I don't know exactly what the frontier is of it, but that seems like, kind of, yeah, like it'd be really cool if we could see any of that, yeah. No, no and also I remember this, uh, advances in technology does not restrict ourselves to remote yeah. sensing. It, it could be in situ as well, though it would be painfully difficult to do it in places where, you know, in California you can do anything or in Kansas. But the question is if you're going to, you know, other countries where you may not have that permission for in situ, it would be even more difficult. Okay. Well, let's so. all do a request for any sort of water quality. <laughs> that's, that's on my wish list. So, um, Holly, I'm. Um, your, your modeling studies this morning looking at Dhaka and you, you said there's almost no data for comparisons, right? Um, so wouldn't this INSAR data be very useful in testing your models? Um, uh, or, or do you think it, it, there's too much non-uniqueness because you don't know storativity very well um, to, um, to be able to, to use it to assess the 
the reliability or, or su of your modeling? Yeah, so I mean, in the Dawson case, we had a lot of decent amount of data, water level data, but we were talking about this earlier. Oh, the mic, mic sorry. Uh, in, in the DACA case, we had a decent amount of water level data, but, but I do think that it would be really interesting to try and use the INSAR data to, to you know, to, as just another source of data for for validation or calibration and and um, it would be you know if in the the larger basin you know groundwater depletion in the Bangladesh in Bangladesh anyway isn't really a big deal so I don't we were saying I don't I don't know if that would work on a larger scale but certainly in um, other areas where maybe there is more uh, of a depletion issue it could be a really good um, calibration target. So just a quick point that I want to make. Um, we talk about all these techniques, and we're really, we have to keep in mind that we're not measuring the same thing. Uh, GRACE looks at gravity, INSAR looks at deformation. Um, we don't really have a good way of integrating all these different measurements yet, and I think that's, that's something that we should think about in terms of um, frontier. But I, I think it's like, I think that because there are some, so how do we, you know, are we measuring the same things? Is the signal, you know, the signal that we're monitoring is correlated at what scale, both spatial and time, and then see how the different technique, what are the property, you know, and then how they are connected to data. Related with the previous um, mention, um, Actually, we I think we need a sort of a methodology to combine all the um, in situ or remote sense data set all together. I think the machine learning technology and data analysis techniques are very useful and will be very key components to combine all the um, available information together and. Um, Based on, um, built on that, we can add more the airborne electromagnetic data set and we can keep building our information further. But, so c can I ask about, that depend how much data we, I mean, you know, for something you have a lot of data, for something you don't, and how much is like you can characterize the, the signal with the machine learning because machine learning can be tricky, you know, in the sense that for some application, I don't know for this because, I mean, anyway, we can talk about. Yeah, for example, um, there's a web page uh, called istrick.org. Uh, they actually collecting all the um, soil data set and they compile um, soil data um, information as, as the data becomes available. So we can kind of try that kind of methodology. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go to the second question. We can always circle back. Um, uh, how can we identify when and where aquifers are being recharged and the sources, source of the water? At what spatial and temporal scales can we meaningfully quantify the recharge process? I mean, this is a bit more specific. And I think all the hints point to in situ kind trace exactly. <laughs> I said, I was going to say isotope. So uh, yes, go ahead, Matt. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that. But then also, I think you know the models are key here, right? So if you can integrate data within a model, you can come up with a you know <laughs> first order estimate of, uh, of of recharge and 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 sources. Um, far from perfect, but you know, other than in situ, I'm not. I'm not sure we could do. I don't think there's a remote sensing um, option here. But through the model and using the remote sensing, it could be like it could be integrating. It could be like a, you know validating and make sure you know to put some constraint on the different component, and then through the model, you know, so that you reduce uncertainty. 
I mean, it is possible in a very sophisticated, you know, if, if let's say you're able to do airborne EM that can actually track a dynamic water table by doing several overflights. You, from the mounding, you can probably infer, but again, that's like a modeled uh, inference. For the scale, I, th I think it's um, for temporal scale, we obviously need to have continuous monitoring and um, that that we have in some places. So it gets back to in situ versus uh, remote sensing. We don't have remote sensing continuously. When it gets to spatial scale, that's usually where, uh, where we kind of have a problem with in situ data. We can't have high spatial coverage with in situ data. So then that's something that we need to define what is um, the minimum scale that we can we need to cover to be able to understand recharge. I mean, the tracer data is actually quite uh, integrative you know, in the sense that it's not going to be just localized if you have uh, you know, enough of it. Uh, the other problem with recharge is that it's not something that's spatially constant even in the plane aquifers, right? That there are hot spots of recharge, even in the high plane aquifer, which is like you know, pretty planes. There's a lot of spatial variability. You have hot spots, and then when you go to the alpine, I mean, mountain or alpine terrains, you uh, again, you there's this delicate balance between where you get recharge zones and where you get ET. It's almost like when you come down an elevation gradient, the point where you start getting a lot of ET, you'll you'll start missing recharge, and a lot of the mountains, mountain hydrology sites, you find that that that's the sweet spot that is mid elevation where you get most of the recharge. So, so maybe that's hmm. something, sorry, uh, maybe that's something that we uh, should focus on as a community. We want to define what is the spatial scale to estimate for certain environment, the minimum spatial scale where we need to do monitoring. But so then I have that, it's like, so like, I guess there's part of like, so what do we want to, we want to understand all this, you know, what, what scale we want to understand the signal. We may have a, maybe a large uncertainty to understand the smaller scale, but then the regional scale, we can say we have an understanding of what is the contribution. So there, maybe it's important also to set, you know, some target to say eventually we want. Yeah, it, it, it's very well the case that uh, where you might be faced with the task of having to sample too much to resolve heterogeneity, uh, the large scale assessments like GRACE come in handy because they give a more integrated picture. But also, yeah, exactly. So I think like eventually maybe you want it, but you know, for some area, maybe it's important enough to understand, can we, I don't know, you were talking about the, the you know, the Ganja Brahmaputra, you know, what is the contribution from the, you know, from the glaciers? And then of course you want to understand better, but if you already have an upper bound, you can reduce the uncertainty in that. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the temporal scales, I agree with what you guys are saying about the spatial scales. Um, so just putting out an answer and then people can tell me if you disagree, but I feel like temporally that probably we are where we're the best, where we have the best chance is understanding seasonal recharge um, and, and closing the water balance on an annual basis, thinking about like seasonal um, snow melt, snowpack and things like that. I think we have maybe we're closer to having a chance for some uh, event based recharge and really highly monitored sites. Uh, where I think that we're the furthest away is in understanding um, recharge that's happened in past climates from like really large recharge events or future recharge that might occur in outlier events that we haven't really observed very closely um, and that that can actually be in some places like the key to understanding <laughs> recharge. So that's, I don't know, that's my take on the temporal scales, but other people can jump in. But Maybe understanding and concerning better, better some of the present day scale, you can put in, you know, you can narrow down your, um, your range for the future. Yeah, I think so. But I mean, I think that like, so one can, we talk a lot about spatial scales of grace, but I think that we should consider also that just the period of record for grace. No, no, but I, is, I, I'm, no, I'm not talking about grace actually now. Yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, if you have like, let's say the GFA, you have a climate model, they you know make assumption, you know, and you just saw and you have a range. So if you can define or make some constraint of sure. what are you seeing now, you're gonna narrow, you know, sure. the solution space when yeah. you make projection. I mean, I think so, except for the fact that I think that we have a, lar a large uncertainty about recharge offense that are just 
not based on things that we're, we've been observing very well. So we have, I mean, there's work in like paleohydrology and things like that that we could use, but that's where I was saying like the period of record for grace, or even if you look at, you know, the 1900s, whatever, where we have most of our observations from, that's maybe not going to give us a very good understanding of our uncertainty or our variability, especially with respect to large recharge events. So uh, let me inter interject here. So when I think of recharge, it's one of the most difficult things to be observed. You cannot observe recharge, you know, technically, unless you put piezometers all along the soil column all the way to your aquifer. So uh, from what I have read and what I have done, recharge is best estimated by models. Uh, and the input to models is precipitation. So if you start wondering about uh, over what amount of area you want to quantify recharge, that becomes a limiting factor. If it's a small area and you have very high resolution precipitation for a long time and you can model the ET and the surface runoff and you have a nice catchment, you know, it's all there, then maybe it's possible to calculate the recharge as your residual in your water balance calculation. Maybe. I'm not trying to say it's correct, but there's no way of validating that recharge. That's where I think that the problem with recharge, I think, is is probably the most difficult thing to measure. I mean, historically, the hydrologic approach is considered inferior to a tracer-based approach because it's unreliable. The uncertainties are too big when you try to do it just purely as a closure to the, to the water budget. Yeah. But you can also, there, there's, you said, you just talking about precipitation, but there's yeah. also artificial recharge. And yeah. you, know, you, 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 you would be able to know what's, going in potentially and you would want to make, make make sure you're managing the use of where you're recharging mm -hmm. and know you know you know you've got the mound in the, in the ground or what you it's, it's just something this would be really useful i think to the management agencies like out in california to know where that water is at any particular time yeah, for example, in the in the Central Valley, precipitation do not play a major role in recharge. It's all directed by how much pumping is occurring in artificial recharge. I just wanted to comment on your comment, Laura. Um, you know, in the southwestern U.S., uh, we know that there are lakes, pl uh, Pleistocene lakes, uh, and the water table has fluctuated by hundreds of meters. Uh, between 20,000 years ago and today. And it would be really cool to take a model like yours and, and test these ideas about changes in temperature during the Pleistocene, changes in recharge, and see if you can reproduce, make those lakes reappear. There's still the uncertainty of <clears throat> how well do we know what the Pleistocene precip and recharge and temperatures were, but it'd be a very neat test of your model to be able to uh, reproduce these these playas that or um, yeah or springs that that um, don't exist today if there's no comment to this uh, so the the fourth question we can probably use the same stuff which we had in the <laughs> last breakout uh, I do not know if we want to modify it or cut it down because we had a longer list than the other groups. Uh, but the third question is, what are the NGA resources which could help us to make meaningful progress in our understanding of recharge? Is there, uh, is there some things over here which are different from what we talked about in the last breakout for our questions on uh, freshwater balance? So I, I actually, can I ask a question about this? So how do we want to frame this? Because something is like the, the thing that we would like from NGA, you know, and that maybe we'll never get, you know? And, and so I'm just thinking about, can, you know, is this, what's the point for us? So it's like the point to say, okay, this is what we would like guys to do, you know, and to give us, you know, in terms of resources. So can we just come up with a creative, wish, you know, there are resources that I can see we can want from them, but I don't know if they're ever going to give us some data or some of those things, you know. So maybe if, 
I don't know how to say this, maybe as I, but if uh, one can frame it in the report as something that in order for them to be able to achieve the level of modeling, you know, or then is gonna be, you know, important or key that we, you know, as a community get on hold of some observation of tool and so have, have a way to leverage, you know, because at the end they wanna try to put up together a model that it gives us a, a way to to provide a service, no? So, so as I said, I think from my discussions with NGA, the the story is that, you know, using this workshop report, they want to launch something for the future. Now that something depends on how the workshop report looks and how much resources they have. And so uh, we should just list what we want rather than worry of what they can give us. Exactly. Yeah, so, so the thing over here would be characterizing groundwater aquifers and uh, understanding of recharge. So what, what is it which NGA can do uh, which, uh, you know, would help us? Could they provide some cluster computer? I mean, yeah, of course. Uh, you mean they, you want supercomputers from yeah, them? Yeah, supercomputers so that the older um, um, correlating uh, university or entity can access to the computer and utilize it. And okay. if they can, uh, they can build up some storages like Amazon, clouding computing system, something like that. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Forget about it. <laughs> no, they are so close. You're not even if you go down to visit, visit NGA in in Northern Virginia, they won't even let you bring your cell phone in the building. Okay, so there's no chance they're going to let you get on their supercomputing network. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> okay, You're going to I, I would, my answer to this question is um, my, my answer to this is is okay. First of all, we don't know. We don't know because yeah. what they have, they don't tell us. But you know, the, I think maybe the one opportunity here is is to recommend that they um, provide opportunities for for partnerships or funding. Mm -hmm. You know, where we can work with them towards a common goal. Um, you know, I think that's where potentially, uh, you know, they could have resources that we could we could leverage. Yeah, like what Matt was you know, saying in the morning. There's only eight countries that share any groundwater data, right? And Recharge is one of the subtler groundwater questions, <laughs> and you're asking whether it's, it's possible to come up with an international part, cooperative partnership of some sort where, you know, different areas of the world would share some kind of data or effort even. Like, let's say there's a, field, let's, let's say there's a global campaign for improved constraints on recharge. Uh, what would that activity involve? It might involve going out and doing depth profiles, I mean, age, age depth profiles, in, in selected aquifers in several regions, and then collecting all the data and putting it together to tell a global story. Is there a will for something like that? Can NGA actually be a steward for an effort like that? But, but it's also, I mean, what Matt said is right. You know, let's say that we said that we have to define a framework for those things. We have funding to work on this, so provide yeah. funding for you know some collaborative research. They move you know toward yeah. the same goal, which means like they can pay us to. Look at the paleo, you know, so do this, or find a, a, a framework to combine the different data. So because then that's going to eventually, they're going to get the benefit of that. Yeah, I mean, if we take the first yeah. step and write a money. white paper on, you know, what would it take for a global groundwater recharge characterization campaign, we can do that part. And if they can be a steward in getting the international partnership, but I doubt very much that they are the ones who would do it. You know, it might instead be a Something like International Hydrological Decade or some banner like that might be a, have a better chance at pulling off that kind of cooperation than an intelligence agency. Kind of yeah. in between what um, the supercomputing capability and the data thing. We've talked about data integration and where we put our data, data storage, but also data accessibility, maybe some kind of streaming where you can uh, go in one place and search for every existing data set. Maybe that's something that they could provide having a platform where they store the data and they're allowed for searching the data, searching what's available. Yeah, so like, I mean, the data don't have necessarily to be an NGA. For example, in INSAR, uh, the data are the property of the space agency, but you have UNAFCO that has um, 
platforms where you can search for a certain area and find every single data set that exists, and then it sends you to where the data are. So the data don't have to be owned or to be located at NGA, but you can have some kind of entity like that that manage data access. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me explain to you, uh, uh, I mean, most of you probably know this, but NGA has what is called a BAA, Broad Agency Announcement. And so it comes out once a year. I think it comes out in April. And they have many, many programs in it, and NGA is one of them. And so the ones which the university people respond to is called NURI, uh, NGA University Research Initiative. And so you write proposals like anything else, and you know they review it, and they send you back your, uh, your, you know, your results. But the thing is that their uh, reviews are not as detailed and 10 pages in 10 point font as in NSF. You know, it's a short review saying that we reviewed your proposal, we did not find it, you know, suitable. But, you know, it's one way of seeing that. So, so obvi obviously it is, it, there are opportunities, there are opportunities, I do not know how it works when you get something funded, and I think Matt knows at least se first or second hand of how it works, but the question really is that if you are chosen one, if Holly is a chosen one for NGA proposal, how can NGA or what kind of questions can she ask or put it for this kind of research for them to help you? Because we do not know once you get chosen what you do with NGA partnership, that's between you and them. So you see, you see where I'm going with this? I'm, try, I'm trying to say, I mean, I'm not trying to, I, I think I, I don't want to be as harsh as Matt and say they will not give you a, a connection to their computer because they can always have a computer in a non-secure contractor location and give you access and put some data. They can always do anything they want. I mean, you will not get access to the computer inside their office, yes, but you could get access to something somewhere else. I mean, they can always make things happen and they normally work with agencies, other federal agencies. So I, I, I hope you know, that's a little bit, makes it a little bit more transparent. I guess so go back to what Matt said a little bit though it's not I'm not sure that I really understand like the question is what are the resources they have that we could use and I just don't think I know what resources they have and earlier you said like when we we're talking about data like well declassify more data so like if you want if they want us to be able to use and collaborate and write good proposals to them then like I would need to know what resources they have for me to leverage. And also what their goals are. I mean, if, if we think of water security as their broad overarching umbrella under, under which all of this is falling, uh, and an element of water security is looking at groundwater sustainability, uh, then you know, what you can offer to them is that in order to get a better handle on water security and identify flashpoints before they arise, uh, they need to invest in whatever, better characterization, whatever we, we lay out in this report. So let, let, let's step to the next one so people can take a break before the uh, breakouts reassemble here. So the last question is, what are some examples of successful collaboration opportunities? Uh, what are promising partnerships to help advance our understanding? Uh, I know Jim and John gave us a lot of comments on that. Do we want to add something else to it above and beyond? Uh, Matt, I would like to ask you, does NASA have any, or JPL for that matter, uh, have any connections with NGA to do these partnerships? We've had one or two projects funded by NGA, but it's you know it's um, really no different from from what other people do. You know, sort of either you know someone and you talk to them, or you apply to one of these for one of these these grants. And so I, I I don't think there's any sort of example that we could use there. I, I don't have anything to add here beyond, but I thought we did a good job answering it in the last breakout, and this is pretty similar. So I don't have anything else to add there.
everybody's pretty tired at this point. Anybody online, Carly? Which, which one? That's fine. Um, advances in technology that enhance the participation of citizens to test and improve reliability and suitability of products across scales. For example, data analytics and synthesis techniques. Um, that's question one. Um, and then I think for question three, uh, there are 11 orders of magnitude in hydraulic conductivity in the soils. A better understanding of soil com complexity or technologies to simplify those complexities can be useful for cross-scale modeling and understanding of recharge slash discharge processes. Um, and that's from Francisco Munoz Ariola, University of Nebraska. Anything else to add? We are fashionably very early here. Stephanie? I, I think people are tired, that's it. Yeah. We'll, we'll ask the academies to pay you over time. Okay, then I think uh, I'll just read out the answers which are up there, or you can see the answers which are up there. If I can, okay, I think we can just. Okay, so let's just look at it. Uh, research frontiers depend on scale of problem, airborne geophysics, two pairs of satellites, uh, ET remote sensing runoff from SWAT, increased resolution, GPS, INSAR, isotopes, INSAR for CalVal. Need a way to integrate all these different measurements, machine learning tech and data analysis, technology that can enhance the participation of citizens. Any more of comments over there? Uh, the, the two pairs of satellites are specifically Grace. Grace, yes, yes. Grace, that's Grace, yes. Yeah, that's Grace, yeah. Yes. Okay, okay, yeah, that, that's. Okay, and the second question was more loaded. Uh, how can we identify when and where aquifers are being recharged and what are the spatial and temporal scales we can meaningfully quantify recharge processes? Uh, in situ data are needed, I think that was simple. Models are the key. Uh, temporal scale, uh, uh, Continuous monitoring, season, understanding seasonal recharge, smaller chance for event-based recharge, low likelihood of past climates. Spatial scale, in situ does not provide high spatial coverage. Re recharge isn't spatially constant. And um, I, I would say, uh, you know, good precipitation data is needed, so. And ET. And ET, uh, yeah. Precipitation and ET, yeah. Anything else in this number two question? Well, there was a comment on, on, the, art on the artificial recharge. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, artificial recharge, yeah. Yeah, but not only precipitation, but any kind of... Uh, any kind of, yeah. also any kind of artificial, yeah, absolutely. And recharge is not just precip on the heat, but it's yeah. also surface water. Surface water, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think recharge is the most difficult thing to figure out. I mean, you know. So what about on off data? If you want to just put, you know, like you have all the features you want. I mean, you have P, you have 
Yeah, yeah but you cannot close it on an event-based basis. Even if you have PNET, you know, trying to do any no, reach. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Refresher port. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. That but that we did have in the last uh, breakout. We had a question about uh, 3D characterization of the mm -hmm. the you know of the underground. So so we had the stratigraphy question. So I guess that would answer it, right? In the last breakout, yeah. Okay. So the third question is: What NGA resources that could ma help make meaningful progress in our understanding of recharge, supercomputing capabilities, uh, provide opportunities for uh, funding towards common goals, steward international partnerships. I think that's a really good one. Uh, data storage, accessibility, utilize NURI grants. We need to know what kind of resources might be available, yet keeping it, giving back, you know, for publicity. And soil complexity or, or technology to simplify soil complexity. I doubt if NGA would be able to do the last one, or they could get access to to doing the last one. Techniques, I think. Not Te techniques, sorry, techniques. Yes. Techniques. I, I guess uh, until, you know, recently, I never even heard of NGA, so uh, if they could do better advertising, uh, if they're interested in... Oh, they're not supposed to. They're secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are. Are they going to shoot us all after this <laughs> workshop? I mean, they are fun. <laughs> Mark, one of the people told me that uh, uh, she thought NGA stood for National Gallery of Art. So. <laughs> it is? Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't even know that. <laughs> I didn't know it stood for National Gallery of Art. Yes. thinking when I said it is that it really the temporal scale and the spatial scale application would be important uh -huh. for artificial recharge. So I, I think we could clarify what it, what about artificial recharge okay. relates to this. And it's being able to you know continuous monitoring to understand um, for managing artificial recharge. But spatial scale again okay. to, to improve uh, understanding of managing artificial recharge. Okay. Awesome, guys. I think we can take a break, and as soon as everybody comes back to the room, we'll go through the last breakout. And Stephanie did such a good job. We request her to do it again. <laughs>